On today's episode... Two-time Academy Award nominated sound designer, Erica Dahl. Inside the mindset that inspired the most successful films in recent history. Transformers, World War Z, Godzilla, just to name a few, and truly just a few. To me, kind of the most important thing is finding ways to inspire yourself. How he overcame the biggest mistake of his career. I lost all of my drives. Weeks of work just up in smoke and discovered the biggest lesson of his life. If you're not making mistakes, you're not casting your net wide enough. The only failure is not trying something. I embody that to my soul, so I had to quickly let go of the notion of being right because it wasn't serving me. It's time to go Inside Quest with host Tom Bilyeu, president and co-founder of the second fastest growing private company in America. And now he's uncovering the universal principles of success. I can tell you right now what principle number one is. Follow your passion. Inside Quest starts right now. Hey, how are you? Doing? Love it. hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inside Quest where we bring on fascinating people and explore and hopefully push forward the growth mindset that success demands of us all. Today's guest is somebody that forces me to confess something, and that confession goes like this. I was very lazy in high school, profoundly lazy. But when I decided to go to college, I realized that I had to change and that I had to start taking myself seriously and work my ass off. So work my ass off I did. And I literally locked myself in my dorm room for four years. For four years I didn't date, I didn't party, I didn't drink, I didn't even leave unless more work demanded it. But even with all of that, I only graduated second in my class. But I have the good fortune today to introduce you to the badass that graduated first, Erica Dahl. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Very gracious introduction. My, my <laughs> pleasure, man. Um, Eric is a two-time Academy Award nominated sound designer, one of the creative minds behind some of the most amazing and successful films of recent memory, Transformers, World War Z, Godzilla, just to name a few, and truly, that is just a few. There are many, many more. Check this guy out on IMDb, it's absolutely amazing. We'll link to it because his name's a little hard to spell, um, but Eric Adal is the name, IMDb, find him, absolutely incredible. Uh, we're going to get into the secrets to his rise. But before we do that, Eric, I had one question. So as sure. we were um, looking at all of this, one question came to mind. I think it's, it's the question that everybody has in their mind here. How in the hell did you beat me in college? <laughs> it's sheer luck. Luck of the draw. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Eric, guys, for, for you guys, it, it really was incredible. Film school, uh, USC's doggy dog, statistically speaking, and please, I know about statistics and how misleading they can be, but statistically speaking, you're more likely to get into Harvard Law than you are to USC Film School. So to get into USC Film School and do as well as he's done truly is miraculous, and it wasn't like, oh, nobody knew. It was clear his films were amazing, and he was one of those guys that just showed a level of polish right from day one. It was really cool to watch you go through film school. He did it with a lot of grace. He was super encouraging. You guys know me. I look for three things, drive, ambition, and compassion. And that last one, the compassion, is the weird one. It's not usually the one you find married to those first two. I think embody that, and certainly having spent four years getting to know you really well in film school, you, you embodied that through the, the hard times when it was super stressful. Uh, so your career has taken off really, really fast, and it's um, obviously after school we sort of drifted our own ways. It's like 20 uh, but, years ago now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's all a lie. It's all a lie. <laughs> That's a terrifyingly true statistic. Wow. Um, and in those 20 years, you've done something absolutely miraculous. Going through your list of accomplishments would be easy, but I don't think it gets to why I was really excited to bring you on today. Reading your notes, reading your advice, and just spending time with you, there's a, this is gonna sound gross at least to me, maybe not to you, but I'll explain why it's weird to me, but a sense of spirituality to the way that you talk about your art. Now personally, I think that we need a new definition for spirituality, because you say it and people expect you to be draped in crystals and like <laughs> burning incense, and that is not me. Um, but there really is something when I think about spirituality, so for me, the, perhaps the most spiritual thing I do is go to the gym. I absolutely hate the gym, do not enjoy working out, but it's a spiritual endeavor for me. It's, it's a pursuit, it's me asking a question, am I willing to do this thing that I don't enjoy to get a result that I so desperately want, right? And it's mm -hmm. that pursuit, it's that um, setting a goal and then chasing that goal that I think really has a spiritual dimension. 
Um, do you think it's accurate to say that your approach to sound in general is a, a spiritual approach? To me, the, the center of it all is finding meaning. You know, ultimately, we're gifted here with this life. We come into the world, we're going to die one day. Everything in between is kind of, if we're lucky, our choice. Where we kind of point our compass and where we go. So, to me, it's, it's about meaning. It is kind of a spiritual idea. It's, um, uh, to me, kind of the most important thing is finding ways to inspire yourself. And You've got an awesome quote about that. Do I? Uh, w w you do. I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, you can't inspire others until you can inspire yourself. And my goal is to give myself goosebumps in everything that I do, right? Right. That was one of those things, man, that hit me so hard. It's incredible. So when did you always think like that? Or did that sort of occur to you at some point? You know, not consciously. Um, like I've been, you know, I'm a sound designer now and I've, since I was a little kid, been exploring that art, um, whether it be through music and piano. I started playing piano when I was five years old, and um, and I enjoyed it. Like you know, my parents noticed that we'd go to somebody's house, and I would just rush to the piano and just start tinkling away, not really knowing what I was doing. But there was something that um, was drawing me towards that self-expression, you know. And I think expression is kind of, to me, a key word. Um, it's, uh, Einstein has this great quote, you know, expression is necessary to evolution. Like, if the bird doesn't sing, if right. it doesn't put its voice out there, it's not going to meet its mate and continue its line on. And I think I apply that to art as well, you know, and, I, and not just so art, but everything, you know. That, let, let me ask you a sure. question really fast. So you've got another quote. Uh, okay. <laughs> you're full of great quotes. I actually really do like your quotes. He said, sound connects us to the deepest part of our soul. And the mm -hmm. note that I wrote in that was, why? From an evolutionary perspective, why would that be? Do you mm -hmm. have any insight on that? Sound is a lot like touch, you know, and you look at the inside of the human ear and it's like little hairs, little cilia, and it's the same exact structure as a unicellular organism with little cilia that it feels and senses its environment from. Wow. So it's, sound is literally touch and it goes to the most primitive... It's giving the chills, that's cool. ...part of our, yeah, it's, it's a part of our body and I think it's so... We're so used to it, you know, we all talk and communicate, listen to music, hear traffic, hear the world, and interpret it, and then communicate those thoughts through abstract language, which is sound. And we're so used to it, because it's so fundamental. But um, if you really step back and look at it, it's mind-blowing. And it has the ability to move us profoundly, inspire us. Um, it's not just an information thing, it's an emotion thing. It works on both the brain and the heart. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that recently I worked on Godzilla, and when I was doing research for that, I was looking into the original Godzilla and some of the processes that they'd used to <clears throat> design Godzilla and create his roar. And the music composer, Akira Ifakube, had this wonderful quote. Um, he said, sound is the most primitive art. And, I, and that's where I'm, why I'm using this word primitive. I'm kind of borrowing his language, um, but it's so true. It's, you know, our ability to hear and sense um, evolved far before our ability to see and even think the way we do now. So to me, it's a very fundamental kind of art and, and I get inspired by it. Now, did you always have a love for sound? Because I wouldn't have, I, in film school, I would not have guessed that that was the path you were going to take. Mm -hmm. Was that something you developed over time or how did that come about? Yeah, I think, um, I think it started with music. Um, uh, they're very similar, you know. Uh, I consider designing sound to be the same thing as composing music. The instruments I use just happen to be kind of infinite. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's something that was kind of random, you know, and serendipitous. Um, started playing with it in film school, and, and then after film school, I kind of had a choice. I had two job offers. One was to go into producing with a well-known production company. And I would have started as like a second, second assistant, and which, you know, I was totally prepared for. And that's the reality. You know, you yeah. always start somewhere and then figure it out and work your way up. And, and I noticed though the vibe in the production company was kind of, it didn't, it wasn't alive. There wasn't mm -hmm. an energy. There was a little bit of a. I don't know if you've ever seen Joe versus the Volcano, yeah, but there's yeah, a scene yeah, of with Tom Hanks and this neon light kind of <laughs> zzz, 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 yes. right? And it kind of reminded me of that. And, 
And then later that day, I went for another interview, and it was with the sound team. And they were, they were working on a, a movie, and the energy and the camaraderie and just the, the joy mm. um, was palpable. And I knew then, I'm like, okay, I know which way I'm gonna go. Wow. And, and it's funny, life is kind of like that. You know, there are these little crossroads, these forks in the road, and you kind of pick one, and it's often based on just a feeling. Mm. And that kind of defines the course of much of your life. But I don't think that means that you're stuck out on a branch either. You can always like come around and try something else too. So I'm not sure if I've, I'm gonna be doing sound design forever. Right. Um, I'll do it as long as I'm in, interested and inspired by it. And, but I, I love all parts of filmmaking, so the, the journey continues. One of the, the things in the evolution of your sound, and you've talked about, um, you've made this really beautiful analogy between being a sound designer is like being a chef. And there's two types of chefs. Those that go and they buy their groceries, which are already, you know, sort of pre-processed in some way. And then there's those who have their own garden. Mm -hmm. And you're truly creating your own sounds. And, and you just mentioned that I'm a, a musician with an infinite number of instruments. Um, and you likened it once to being meditative. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. And do you also do traditional meditation? Um, yes. Um, not as much as I, I should. Um, Why do you think you should, though? Well, because I, I, I have learned the benefit of it. And I kind of think of it like a river that's turbulent. You know, there's all this sort of silt that comes up and it clouds the river. And the act of meditation allows you to not be thinking. And when you can kind of still the waters, then the silt sinks and you get clarity at least for me. And so about 10 years ago, I studied transcendental meditation. And uh, to me, that was kind of an eye opener. And it was actually because of a book that David Lynch wrote, Catching the Big Fish. And he described that process of, you know, when you're in a state of anxiety or activeness in your mind, you're just skimming the surface of the water. And that's where all the little minnows are way up on the surface. But if you want to catch the big fish, the big ideas, you got to sink down deeper. And that's what meditation does, is it gets you deeper into the experience. And what I love about sound, and especially recording sound, is it's like instant meditation. I was working on a Terrence Malick movie um, uh, called The Tree of Life. And as part of prepping for that film, I did some traveling and um, a lot of recording. And there's a whole part of the film that takes place in the Cretaceous period. And there's very few places around the world where you can record anything like the Cretaceous period. And of course, there's many extinct species that um, you'd have to completely reconstruct. So for the Tree of Life, I went to Cambodia, which has some of the most ancient jungles and, and forests. And um, I had a tour guide that would take me around in the middle of the night and out to these locations where it would just be this lake with thousands and thousands of frogs all singing to each other like a chorus, like an orchestra. And I was doing this over a period of a few weeks and at one point I found myself out in the middle of the jungle and, and by this point I probably had like 200 mosquito bites all over my body, <laughs> you know. As, um, <laughs> Hopefully we had our malaria shots. We did have okay. that. <laughs> um, I was sneaking up on these two little frogs and from a distance, I could hear them singing to each other. And one little guy would go and the other guy would reply. And then sometimes they'd start syncopating and like weaving their little clicks together into these little wow. rhythms. And it's very, you know, to me, just incredible. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I was trying to sneak up on them, like get close enough to get a good mic angle on them and get a really clean recording with a nice stereoscopic image of the two of them going. And it took me about probably 20 minutes of just like a foot or two at a time. Yeah. Then they stop because they hear you yeah, and yeah. sense you. Then you wait a minute and they start going again. And finally I got just a few feet away from them. And so I record them for 20 minutes or so until I felt like I had what I needed. And I'm about to grab my mic and go away. And there's this jungle cat laying right next to me. <laughs> You're, you're still alive, so I guess we have a happy and, ending here. And but. it wasn't like a mountain lion size thing. It was bigger than a domestic cat, but not right. like a huge um, carnivorous thing that could take me down, okay. I, I would think. Um, 
but it taught me something, and it was about awareness, you know, too. You know, I was, I was focusing on these little frogs, and they were aware of me mm -hmm. um, because they stopped singing every time I was getting closer and closer. Um, but I got so wrapped up in their little song that I wasn't noticing something big happening right, right next to me. But so, if there's a point to this story, it's that um, meditation can be really good in the sense of finding clarity, listening, being aware, but you need the other side of it too to make that worth it. So I think everything is a balance between meditation, it's kind of like you're getting your clarity, and then switching modes and finding purpose and direction and then going towards it. Everything's a balance that way. Yeah, that's one of the most beautiful explanations of meditation and its usefulness I've ever heard in my life. Um, I'm not a big meditator. I, I use what I call power meditation. Um, and as you were describing, when you were talking about David Lynch and the silt mm -hmm. settling, um, that was a very clear image for me. But as you were saying it, I was like, the only reason I would spend the time to do that, to settle the silt, is because at that moment of clarity, I'm going after something, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about that switching um, between modes, and the brain is broken into so many different modes, it's, it is almost, because mm -hmm. as you're describing the frogs, I'm thinking, that's beautiful, getting lost in that. Like, that's mm -hmm. that moment of beauty. Like, that is, that is not something I would want to give up. Like, that moment where you're so immersed in what you're doing, you lose your sense of self. Um, so I love that sense of, of being totally myopic on something. But, at some point, it, it be because I judge everything by utility, right? So that mm -hmm. first you have to understand that. Once you get that I judge the entire world, every skill, every choice, everything by its utility, mm -hmm. um, it, you'll understand the following. Meditation to me, if it has utility, if it settles the silt, you get a moment of clarity, you can go after something. If it's, um, you know, you're spending your time in this beautiful moment, but you're forcing yourself, you're training yourself to, to do both, right? To be in that moment completely, totally there. But I'm aware when the cat comes up, right? To, mm -hmm. to use that, to leverage that. Then I can see how that, that really is useful. And I know, look, I can already predict the YouTube comments. You just don't get it. Like, you've never tried it. You're doing it wrong. Um, and, and, you know, I'm certainly open to that this isn't a universal experience. But that's always been um, my struggle with meditation. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to empty my mind any more than I need to to get an effect. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you might be able to expand your mind by letting it contract. You know, it's like, like the heart isn't going to pump its blood if it's always clenched. Right. You know, it needs to let it go. And it's like the tides. And um, so I totally know what you're talking about because I, I struggle that, with that myself that I can't turn off ever. Like, I'm processing, 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 thinking. I'll finish work, get home. It might be the middle of the night. And I still want to churn through what had happened and what is yet to happen. But I've just found that I'm able to actually be more effective when I can take a breath yeah. and uh, release the muscle, let the, let the muscle relax. For sure. And then you can contract that muscle yeah. even harder the next time. Brilliant, but. brilliant way to explain that, for sure. Still ahead on Inside Quest. The only failure is not trying something. Sure. Like, feel free to try and mess up, try again, mess up, doesn't matter. In fact, my first job working for a major film studio was a disaster. It was a total mistake. And I'm so grateful that that happened. Inside Quest continues right now.